Okay, so let's start today. We will talk about chapter seven and chapter eight. Now we start at chapter eight, which is wrong. We will start at chapter seven. So chapter seven is where we actually make the interpreter and actual interpreter where we actually make it interpret something. That's why they make, make uh, this image. For this interpreter though, we just execute the syntax tree directly, which is the simplest way to write an interpreter basically. Uh, right now, our parser only support expressions. So to execute code, we just evaluate expressions and produce a value. And then there are two questions. One is what kinds of values do we produce? And two is how, how do we organize those chunks of code? And we will talk about them one at a time. So, In our language logs, values are created by literals and uh, we can use expressions to compose them and then do some computation and finally we store them in variables. In this interpreter, the value and object are pretty used pretty much uh, interchangeably, but later in the C interpreter, we will have distinguishing uh, distinction between them. The users uh, see these as logs object, but they are implemented in the underlying language our uh, interpreter is written in. So in this case, it's Java. And the Java is static typed. Our logs is dynamically typed, so we need to represent that. And in this in this interpretation. <laughs> Uh, implement, sorry, in this implementation, we use this Java land dot object, which is like the, the super class of everything. And we use this to represent, represent a logs object basically. Which I'm, I'm not sure if I like this choice or not, but that's what this implementation does. And so for any logs value, we can represent it as a Java land or object. So any logs object basically can be any Java object. And then Basically for logs, literals, uh, logs primitives, we can represent them as Java stuff equivalent. And for new, we just represent it as Java now. And we can use Java's instance of operator to determine at runtime 
what he, what is the runtime type of the of a certain object. Does Java have pattern matching? Does like modern Java has pattern matching? Anyone knows? I think not exactly. It has switch expressions, but I don't think that's the same thing. Yeah, that's not pattern matching. So yeah, if they are pattern matching, then probably pattern matching is better, but otherwise you know, instance of it works. So we can have a uh, interpret method for this, all the syntax tree classes, but we implemented this like neat visitor pattern last chapter. So we better use them and <laughs> And in this case, we will just have a, like interpreter as a visitor of expression because we only have expression now. And the neat thing about Java is that visitors can actually uh, Java generic is that visitors can actually return a uh, value. If I implement equivalent in C++ before where C++, uh, C++ template basically, you can't have this kind of thing. You can't return a template type. So that's really annoying, but in Java, you can actually do this. And for 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 literals, for literals, we basically don't need to do anything. We just returns its value. And and then Java basically will convert this into an object type, and we are done. And the, for the grouping, for the grouping, we just evaluate what's inside. So that's also, that's also doesn't have much and we have this we have this helper function this help function to simply send the expression back into interpreters uh, visitor implementation and here is the is a note. Uh, some parsers don't define tree nodes for parentheses. Instead, they parse they parsing a uh, parentheses expression and simply retain the node for the inner expression. And we do create a node for parentheses in logs because we'll need it later to correct handle the left hand side of assignment uh, expressions. And that's that's a good reason to preserve parentheses. I think another good reason is if you want to do some kind of 
uh, formatting kind of like if you want to just do the formatting as print the AST kind of approach. I know some other languages do formatting by just tokenize and then do some magic rather than doing parsing. But some, some other languages like Go, they actually just print the AST. And in this case, we need to preserve every syntactic details of the original program. And evaluate unary expressions. This is also pretty straightforward. We, we just evaluate what's inside. And then we only have one unary expression type minus, and we just negate. Uh, notice, notice here that we don't really know what is the type of write. And we do a cast here, cast into a double. We, we just say this type is a double. Um, and if the right-hand side is actually not a double, like it's a Boolean or something, we just get a Java exception. And yeah, we will get it into that. Also, also here is the unreachable code, which when we write interpreter, this this kind of situation actually happens quite a lot. Uh, this means our interpreter is doing a post-order traversal yeah, for the unary expression because we always evaluate what's inside. And if we have nested unary expression, we still always evaluate what's inside first. And it's always on the right-hand side. Then the other unary expression is uh, logic not. And that's this have some special handling rather than a simple cast because uh, logs language has this uh, concept of truth and uh, so it's not simply just Boolean. If you remember JavaScript that sometimes we have ban ban to like see if an object is not null. Yes, when we have truthy, then we have this kind of interesting stuff. So, so yeah, this, this basically says what it means to be true or false other than true and false. Um, so we introduce this concept of truthy where every object they are either truthy or falsy and And logs follows the rubies 
simple rule where false and male are falsy, everything else is truthy. The in other languages, it can be more complicated, aka JavaScript, where empty, empty strings, empty arrays, and zero are falsy. And it can become weird because string zero is truthy and JavaScript is very good at implicit conversion. So in Python, empty strings are also faulty, but other uh, empty sequences are faulty too. And in PHP, both the number zero and the string zero are falsy. And other non-empty strings are truthy. So it's kind of a mess to define the semantics of this and every language is slightly different. Yeah, just reading that sidebar makes me appreciate Java more where only true is truthy. <laughs> Uh, uh, I think, yeah, I think like more modern language kind of, more, more of them use uh, like, this got a little bit of convenience and just say only true and false are tr truthy and falsy and everything else are error. Yeah, I guess I guess some sometimes it's like we have a lot of convenience features, like for example, C or JavaScript have a lot of those kind of things. And then later we find that the semantics becomes a mess because of that. And binary expressions. And similarly, similarly, we just evaluate the left hand side and right hand side, and then and then do the binary expression. We we also do the cast here. And the interesting thing is, we kind of nail the down on the semantics of language in the interpreter. We uh, we didn't def probably we didn't define that in logs. We but when we write an interpreter, we must define the semantics uh, because now we know the left hand side is always evaluate before the right hand side. Mm -hmm. And. Currently, our language is pure, so it doesn't matter. But if later our expression can do some side effect, then the, the choice of which side to evaluate actually matters. And, and then he said, I left out one arithmetics operator because it needs some special handling where we can add both numbers and also strings. Basically, he said we overload the plus operator for strings, which I think people nowadays usually consider it a language design mistake now to overload plus for string concatenation. And I know it caused headache in C++, basically. <laughs>
And uh, yeah, for for comparison, comparison we do similar kind of stuff. In our language is pretty simple, so we don't need to overload a comparison operator since that we just cast to cast our object to numbers since we can only uh, only do the comparison for numbers. And for for the equality, we also need to do a little bit uh, special handling. But basically, if it, like both objects are now, then they are equal. Otherwise, they if one of them is now, then it's not equal. And otherwise, we use Java's uh, equal method. So basically, we cheat by using by using Java's method. Okay, there is a side note about NAN. And well, NAN is really weird because it doesn't equal to anything, including itself. And it further says in Java, the equal operator on primitive doubles preserve this behavior, but this equal method does not. And since logs use this equal method, it does not follow IEEE. And yeah, those kind of weird things is the danger of directly using the underlying language stuff because they probably have, can have subtle language semantic differences. But in this case, we just say, ah, okay, we will just use the semantics of this, which, which is, uh, does not preserving this NAN not equal to NAN behavior. So we are not the IEEE. And it's fine because this is just for educational purpose. And then, then we further comment that those, the cast, all the cast above can fail. And if it fail, we get a Java exception, which is not, not really nice to deal with directly. So we need to do something about it. Uh, the previous chapters all ha uh, already have like syntax or static errors, but we don't have any kind of runtime runtime errors yet. And currently, currently we just have a J uh, Java have a Java exception, which we kind of exposed as the implementation details. And we need to actually catch them and do something about it. It also it also have a little side note about undefined behavior in C. And then it says the Java behavior exception, Java exception does have one thing, right? Which is when we're doing this kind of code, it says, oh, we cannot negate a muffin. And then, then we will immediately stop interpretation and just this left hand side get untouched.
also, also another thing is that if we just throw the Java exception, not only the user user see a really bad error, we also we also uh, uh, Not only the user see a really bad error, we, what? So sorry, my Zoom just crashed again. So basically, when we have a runtime error. We shouldn't kill the interpreter. If we just let Java exceptions through and never catch them, we just kill the interpreter, which is not acceptable. And we, if we have a repo, we still want to like uh, print some error message and then continue running the repo. So we must uh, catch that exception. Uh, so our interpreter evaluates nested expression using recursive message call. So we need to unwind out all of those above, which is a really nice thing about Java exception is that it performed the unwinding for us. However, um, instead of using Java's cat filler, we can define our own log specific ones. So, so before we do the cast, we can actually write a function to check for the number of operand and for the check, we do something like this. Otherwise, we throw a new exception with uh, error message we want. Yeah, and this run this runtime error will actually also takes a token. So, and the token uh, in this case point to the operator. And this, this way, we kind of know where in the source code this error message occurs. And then for the for the each for each of the for each of the code, that we we can actually. Uh, for each of the binary uh, operators, we can uh, call this check number operands, which have the operator and left and right. And this check number number operands is the same as the unary one, just it takes two operands together and 
and to this And um, it's first further comments that there's a subtle uh, subtle semantic choice here, which is we evaluate both operand before checking the type of uh, the errors, which is like this function. We will perform the side effect of here, so we'll print left, and side effect of here that we'll print right, and then we will report error. But another way is actually we will perform the side effect here and we immediately find that we have the wrong type and then just report it. And finally, finally, we when we hook up the interpreter, we just do a for each expression, we just do a try catch block. We, if we if we can evaluate uh, expression into a value, we just we just print them, make a streamified version of it and print them. Otherwise, we print a runtime error. Well, if we catch a runtime error. If we catch something else, then it's not a logs error, but some other kind of error, then we, we just don't deal with them. And for the streamfy, for the streamfy method of uh, value, Uh, for the simple case, for the now, we just return new. And then we can, for the double, we do, we do streamify operation, but then if it end with dot zero, so it's like when dot zero, we drop that dot zero because in logs, everything is uh, double. We don't need to distinguish between like one and 1.0. And we just print the simplified version. And in in other, the case of other object, we just do, use two string. And yet again, well, since I guess logs does not define the semantics, we just take care of those semantics to make sure that the two interpreters work exactly the same. And just doing language when doing a language implementation, there are a lot of those kind of subtle behaviors that is an important part of the job because users rely on those details. A lot of times it's not, it's inadvertently. And for report runtime error, we actually can report them gracefully because we have a token, so we can report a line number. And also we will have a error message. This has runtime error boolean, which is not, not that useful for now. But, but I guess late, later, uh, I guess, yeah, it's, 
it's used immediately for the main function to just, if we have runtime error, we exit in a different error code. And I guess here is just some other boilerplate where we have interpreted the logs. The logs class can actually start to instantiate and use it. And then for the last chapter, we actually just print the ASD and replace it with the interpreter. And for this chapter, we can actually We can actually just call this. And yeah, that's we, we are basically done. We have a little simple interpreter in our hand. And this interpreter can can basically run, they can calculate the expressions. It cannot do much because well, we don't have some really important constructs like loops or conditionals. So, but we actually have a full blown interpreter up to this point. And there's a uh, design note about static versus dynamic types, which I really like. So some languages like Java are statically typed, uh, other like logs are dynamically typed and defer type checking until runtime before an operation is attempted. And so we tend to consider this uh, black and white choice, but there is actually a continuum between them. It turns out most statically typed languages do some type checking at runtime. The type system checks most type rules statically, but insert some checks at runtime. For example, in Java, the static type system says the cast expression will always safely succeed, but the dynamic this uh, runtime system says that the runtime semantic is that the cast fails, we will have a runtime exception. Oh, and there is this co co covariant array thing in Java and C sharp, which is widely considered a design mistake nowadays. Uh, for example, if we have an have a array, which we say is an integer array, so Java will have an integer array, but then we store them as an object array. Yeah, so we do some apps, app, app casting for the array. And then the second line, we actually modified one of, one of the element into a string, which is totally legal because it's an object array, totally legal statically. But then JVM all, always inserts some runtime check. To make to make this uh, to make this fail. Um, so so another another choice another choice is make this invariant, for example, in language like C++, and this is just, this will just not work, the first line. We, we cannot app, app cast an array, basically. But this pattern was particularly important for usability in Java 1.0 because it 
didn't have generics. And then the Java designers just said, it's okay to treat it off a little bit of static uh, type safety guarantees and performance because like every access, we need to do some runtime checking. In returns of the flexibility. And uh, it further comments that a few st static type languages uh, that don't make that trade off somewhere. For example, Haskell, Haskell lets you run code with non exhaustive matches. And then if you have something that matches, it will be a runtime error. So some sometimes sometimes uh, it's okay to take shortcut to without sacrifice too many benefits of step, uh, safety by deferring some type tracking, but uh, but also on the other hand, a key reason users use static type languages is for the type system give guarantees and defer too many type checks at until runtime we just don't have that confidence anymore. Yeah, and I want to further comment a little bit on this. So I think when I learned Scala, uh, someone mentioned someone mentioned about covariant containers will only work if uh, if this kind of, uh, I guess the Java terminology is collection. Covariant collection will work if the collection is immutable. So like for immutable, vectors like those kind of things in Scala is fine to make it covariant, but not array because array is mutable and and as we said here, like if we do mutation, it's not safe. And we must inter insert runtime checks. But if it's co covariant, uh, well, if it's immutable, if we then update this, uh, update this array here, we actually update the underlying object itself. So we can see we uh, this stuff is actually still an integer array, but but we have a stuff too, which after modification is an object array. Okay, I think let, let's end it here since we only have five people today and I'm not in the mood to do another chapter.